Hello everyone. Today we'd be discussing social changes and gendered achievement. Social changes and gendered achievement. The changes our society has experienced, changes such as changes in culture, cultural changes, economic changes, or for the matter of fact, political changes, or we could even say the changes in terms of how our industries work and operate. How is it that these changes have actually affected gendered achievement? Or how is it that we could use these uh, different changes to explain why there are differences in terms of educational attainment on the basis of gender, on the basis of gender? Before we even begin, let me remind you all, as we discussed this in the last topic, if we speak about the 1970s and 1980s, during the 1970s and 1980s, a major concern always used to be about female underachievement. Female underachievement used to be a concern. Female underachievement. However, if we speak about how things are like today, or if I may say, if we talk about the changes that our society has experienced in the last 30 or 40 years, today with the past of time, it has been noted that females, by and large, do better than boys. So the concern today is more in terms of male underachievement. Now, this is, again, I'd rather say arguably male underachievement. Now, a change from female underachievement to male underachievement today. Now, even if we have a look at statistics, we'd get to see that since the last 30 to 40 years, there's been a dramatic amount of change experienced in terms of females doing better as compared to males when it comes to educational attainment. By and large, in almost all uh, uh, all at, uh, at almost all levels, we see that females today are doing better than males or we see that girls today are doing better than boys. Now, according to Francis and Skelton, according to these two feminists, Francis and Skelton in 2005, what they uh, feel is that despite of the fact that girls today are doing better, despite of the fact that girls today are performing better, better it is still noted according to uh, Francis and Skelton again, that females or the achievement of females has been marginalized, or in other words, it has been pushed towards a corner. Likewise, they believe, they feel that uh, how the school performance of girls, it's been kept at a peripheral, right? They've been cornered down and they made to feel like they do not count. Now we're talking about, I just mentioned two feminists, Francis and Skelton in 2005, they believe despite of the fact that females are doing better, why is it that the focus still remains on the underachievement of boys? Why is it that nothing is written about or not enough, rather say not enough is written down, written about in terms of how females are doing better? Why is it that there's still less of focus on how females did achieve whatever they did achieve? Instead, if anything, people worry about why males are underachieving. Now, taking this uh, step ahead, another thing that has to be kept in mind over here is, which we'd be discussing in detail further, when we speak about female and uh, when we speak about females doing better, a question that rises over here is, do all females do better? Now, when I say do all females uh, uh, do all females do better, over here what I'm trying to explain is, there there's a possibility that only some females, that is females probably from the more affluent background, females from a richer background, females from an upper social class would be the ones who would be doing better. And again, at the same time, there's always a possibility that females from the working class background might not be doing well. So we'd uh, be discussing this point in the next 15, 20 minutes. But for now, what has to be kept in mind is when we speak about or when we use the phrase uh, female overachievement, we need to be cautious, we need to be careful that we do not end up generalizing this because there's a possibility that not all females or not females from all social classes would be doing better. Now, before we take uh, this topic any further, I'd like to put this into different categories, different headings rather, so that uh, the explanation gets easier, so that you guys understand it in a better manner. Now, 
let me remind you we're discussing all of this under the heading of the social changes and gendered achievement i'd like to divide this topic into six uh subtopics to begin with, initially, we'd speak about changing expectations and attitudes of females. Number two, we'd speak about how the different women's movements and feminism has played its role in terms of females performing better today. Number three, we'd speak about how the changes in the labor market have led to females standing a better chance in terms of having job opportunities. Number four, we'd speak about... Uh, uh, number four, we'd speak about individualization, or in other words, we talk about the extent to which today uh, being, uh, being, being, being uh, self-reliant, being self-sufficient, being uh, self-constructive, constructed, or uh, for the matter of fact, being self-oriented rather, has played its role in terms of females performing better, right? The extent to which being self-oriented, or in other words, thinking about your own self first, has led to females doing better. Then the fifth and the sixth topic, this has more to do with uh, male and achievement. So broadly speaking, we'd uh, discuss this uh, topic for today under five different headings. To begin with, we'd start off with changing expectations and attitudes of females. Now, when we speak about changing expectations and attitudes of females, in the last topic, we had spoken about the study that was conducted by the popular feminist Sue Sharp. Sue Sharp conducted her study. Uh, if you remember, if you may remember, Sue Sharp conducted her study once in 1976, and then she conducted her research again in 1994. Sue Sharp conducted her research in 1976, and then she conducted her research in 1994. According to the study that Sue Sharp conducted in 1976, it was the attitude, it was the expectations, or to put it in an even simpler manner, it was the priorities that girls had set that were making them underachieve priorities. Now, what sort of priorities am I talking about? I'm talking about life priorities, priorities in life. So the study, my dear, that was conducted by Sue Sharp in the year 1976, according to Sharp, school girls back in the 1970s, that is 1976, if you ask them about the priorities they had in life, for them, it was love, marriage, husband, and children, more or less in, in this order, love, marriage, husband, children, and then came their profession, and then came their career, and then came their education. So, of course, according to Sue Sharp, if you're prioritizing love, marriage, husband, children, and then you think about your career and your profession, that pretty much explains why females uh, were not doing as well as they were expected to do. Now, like I said, Sue Sharp conducted a research once in 1976, and then she conducted a research again in 1974, uh, 1994, 76, and then 1994. That's good about uh, 76, 86, 96, two years short. So I'm 18 years after the initial research she conducted. So when Sue Sharp conducted a research again after 80 year, 18 years, what she found out was that there was a significant amount of change. There was a significant amount of change in terms of the expectations or the uh, attitude or, uh, for the matter of fact, the priorities that girls held now. The study that she conducted in 1994, according to Sue Sharp again, girls now had started prioritizing their career. And once you prioritize your career, once you move focus towards your profession, you have all the reasons to put in efforts when it comes to education. Because remember, education is seen to be a vehicle or a mechanism that leads to you, uh, your, 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 uh, what do you call it? Uh, your uh, uh, life chances getting better, right? So education as is seen or as, is seen as a vehicle that helps you experience upward social mobility. Education is seen as a vehicle that helps you get better jobs, which of course lead to being financially independent. So in a nutshell, the comparison of the two uh, comparison, if we speak in terms of comparison between the two researches that were conducted by Sharp initially 19, uh, 76 and then in 1994 in these 18 years what Sue Sharp felt was the expectations and the attitudes that girls carried towards their uh, their profession 
subsequently leading to uh, subsequently led to them performing better in education now if we delve in this further and try to look at the possible reasons behind this what was the reason behind this change in expectations and attitudes according to sharp if we talk about marriage rate back in 1970s around 80% of girls were interested in getting married back in 1970s around 80% of girls were interested in getting married however according to sharp when these girls were asked again or when girls were asked in the 1990s around 45% of them wanted to get married so if you have a closer look there's been a sharp very sharp drop down rate when it comes to uh getting married or the girls wishing to get married and a possible reason behind this so see it's all linked it's like a chain according to sharp girls attitudes and expectations and ch had changed if we try uh like i had said earlier delving into this further why could this be i mean why why is it that this changed uh, happened why is it that girls now had different priorities a possible reason behind this could be them not being so interested in getting married as much as they were before now why is it that they were not interested in getting married they were probably not interested in getting married because there's been a rapid rise in the divorce rate back in the 1970s and 1980s as you must have if you remember you we you must have studied this in uh, AS, AS sociology when you were preparing for paper two family there's what there was a sudden rise in the divorce rate in the UK uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s many sociologists refer to it as the dam effect right now because of this sudden amount of increase in the divorces taking place girls now when I say now I'm referring to the 1990s girls according to Sharp had started to become very wary they were pretty cautious they were being careful about getting married because of course when you see everyone around getting divorced you would want to think twice before you uh, step into uh, a relationship and getting married so in the 1970s over 80 percent of girls wanted to get married but the 1990s this had dropped to 45 percent the girls were increasingly wary of marriage with the rapidly rising divorce rate in britain throughout the 1980s and 1990s they had seen adult relationships breaking up around them now this uh pretty much explains why girls did not want to get married and when they did not want to get married this led to there being an increase in the amount of uh, interest girls had started taking in education which subsequently led to them getting better job opportunities too now taking this a uh, step ahead another important uh uh thing that i'd want everyone to keep in mind the changing expectations and attitudes of girls were reflected both by their parents and their schools as well right the changing uh, expectations and attitudes of girls were reflected both by their parents and the schools as well a number of studies particularly those of girls from the middle class families indicated that parents increasingly expect exam results exam success and in some cases they also made the daughters feel like they were never being they were never good enough so all of these sort of changes help us understand the differences in uh, educational attainment based on gender so like i said earlier we uh, are discussing social changes and how social changes could be used as an explanation towards differences in educational attainment of course in context of gender the first point the first heading the first subtopic that we discussed was changing expectations and attitudes of females number two the second factor that i'd like to discuss over here is women's movement and you may also refer to this as feminism now uh there have been quite a lot of women's movement many of them gained popularity some did not they uh gained popularity and they 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 uh these these movements they're better known during the 1960s and 1970s era so a lot of women's movement a lot of feminist uh movements that rose or gained popularity in the 1960s 
these movements actually did get success. These movements uh, were successful when it came to bringing in changes in the legal system. Now, what sort of changes are we talking about in the legal system? We're talking about the changes in the legal system that facilitated females better. Changes in the legal system that also provided women with better opportunities. Now, for instance, there were some laws that were passed as well, if I may name the Equal Opportunity Act or the Sex Discrimination Act. You might as well Google this. These laws, these laws, these laws primarily, I mean, the changes that uh, were made in the legal system and these different bills being passed, Primarily, if we talk about uh, the reasons or the if we talk about uh, if, if we start giving credit to what led to these changes, it, it would be women's movement. Right. So many women's movement led to uh, bringing in a change or was successful in bringing in a change in the legal system. Now, if we talk about this change in the legal system, you do realize if females are. Uh, if females are uh, given the surety, if females are given the surety that if they'd be putting in efforts tomorrow, they'd get an equal opportunity. If females are again given the surety that if they start putting in efforts, they would not be discriminated against. Don't you think this automatically would result in females getting encouraged? And if females know for a fact that putting in efforts today while getting educated would lead to them have an equal opportunity would lead to them have uh, having a better chance than before when it comes to getting a job or being a part of the job market this would this would this would this would mean that females are now uh, females now have a reason to put an effort so that tomorrow they could get financially independent tomorrow they could get financially independent so these changes made in the 1960s and 70s, these movements in the 1960s and 70s, 1970s led to there being changes in the legal system. Feminists, uh, uh, many females now expected equal opportunity in the education and also in the labor market too. So according to Mitsos and Brown in 1998, women's movement has provided both one incentive to females right incentive because now they know if they're putting in effort today they this these efforts that they're putting today would be fruitful tomorrow and along with incentives this is providing young women with direction women's to, women today have a direction or young girls today have a direction they have a direction they have a purpose they know putting in efforts today would uh stand them would would give them better opportunities would give them more opportunities than before in the job market or in the labor market. So taking this ahead, in their view, there as in Mitzis and Brown's view, the women's movement and feminism have achieved considerable success in improving the rights and raising the expectations as well as the self-esteem of women. So we just got done with discussing two factors. The first factor that we discussed was, uh, the first factor uh, the first factor that we discussed was uh, uh, was changes in the expectations and attitudes of females. The second factor that we discussed was women, women's movement and feminism. Now, taking this ahead, this third factor that we're discussing is changes in the labor market. I'm sure you'd all agree over the last 50, 60 years, there have been significant amount of changes in our economy in the British economy as well there's been a decline in heavy industry you do realize a decline in heavy industry uh one of the reasons behind this decline in heavy industry was because of automation because of technological advancement now because of automation technological advancement today the amount of people or the amount of workers required as manual workers that has been decreasing today you do not need as much as manual workers as you did, let's just say, a couple of decades back. Now, why is that so? Like I mentioned, that's because of automation. That's because of better. Uh, that's that's because of advancements in the industrial sector. This, uh, was one change. Another change was an increase in the service sector. There's been a lot of job opportunities when it comes to service sector 
let me assume we all know the difference between the manufacturing industry and the service industry. Manufacturing industry, when you're manufacturing products, service industry, when you're providing services from banking to uh, legal firms, to law, firm, to law firms, to teaching, to insurance, uh, insurance agents to consultants so on and so forth so this rise in the service sector the growth in the service sector along with employment employers along with employers now showing readiness towards accepting flexibility in terms of working hours flexibility in terms of uh, uh in terms of uh, the working hours or even them allowing part time work Right. So these changes, change number one, a decline in the manufacturing industry, change number two, a growth in the service industry, change number three, allowing flexible work, allowing part time work. All of this has expanded the amount of opportunities that females had as compared to the past. Now, all of this has actually worked in favor, favor of females. The growth in employment opportunities, along with the rise in young women's occupational ambitions, has increased their incentives to gain educational qualifications. So yeah, the growth in empl employment opportunities along with a rise in young girls' occupational ambitions. Occupational ambitions, again, this could be related to the first point and the second point that we just discussed. First point being changes in the expectations and attitudes. And the second point being women's movement and feminism has increased their incentives to gain educational qualifications. According to Francis and Skelton, Studies of both primary and secondary school students show that many girls are now looking forward to jobs that require degree level qualification. Why is it that they're looking for jobs that require degree level qualification? That's because they're more educated females now. We have more educated females now because females, they have career aspirations, they have role models, they have better job opportunities, which has led to their expectations, their attitude towards education changing, which consequently has led to them performing better. So we just discussed three factors. The fourth factor that I'd like to bring in under discussion that could help us understand uh, that could help us understand uh, differences in terms of uh, educational uh, attainment based on gender. This fourth factor that we're discussing over here was put forward by Beck in the year 1992. This is about individualization and the risk society. Individualization and the risk society. One at a time, let's start off with individualization. What does the word individualization mean? Individualization, when we refer to individualization, our focus is on being self-oriented. See, it's written over here being being self oriented being emphasizing on self construction emphasizing on self reliance emphasizing on self sufficiency right if i put it in a simple manner when you start believing that you come first right or i come first being self oriented being self oriented remember connect dots here being self oriented or when you start believing that you come first, when you start believing as a female that you come first. So according to Beck, Beck argued that the West especially is moving from modernity, that is traditional modernity, into a new phase of modernity, which he calls the second modernity. His changes, now why is he referring to uh, second, uh, refer, referring to individualization as second modernity, or why is it that he's uh, wanting to differentiate between traditional modernity and second modernity. His views have been used to help explain the dramatic changes, change in women's educational achievement. So dramatic changes in women's educational achievement, dramatic changes in women's educational achievement. We're linking this up with individualization. When we speak about individualization over here, and remember when we had spoken, when we discussed about the rise in divorce rate. We'd spoken about the rise in divorce rate and we had also discussed that this rise in divorce rate had led to women's expectations and attitude towards education changing. Why is it that their expectations and attitude towards education had changed? Part of this could partially be explained 
because of the fact that now there were more of females who were wanting to be self-reliant. There were more of females who wanted to be self-sufficient. And this self-sufficiency, this self-reliance could be obtained through educational qualification. Now, remember, higher educational qualification means you stand a better chance of getting a job that could make you uh, financially independent, right? That could make you financially independent. Now, according to Beck, today's society is characterized by risk and uncertainty. Now, see, like I said, this has to do with individualization and the risk society, right? According to Beck, today's society is characterized by risk and uncertainty and by a process of individualization. For example, with the rising divorce rate in many countries, marriage is increasingly associated with risk and uncertainty, as discussed earlier. Employment is becoming more unstable. There are fewer jobs for life. People are changing jobs very more often. They're retraining. There's been an improvement and People today work towards learning newer skills. As a result, the job market and the career paths have become less predictable. If they're less predictable, that means there's more of uncertainty. A process of individualization accompanies risk and uncertainty. People are increasingly thrown back on themselves as individuals, right? I come first, remember. They're more and more responsible for their own fate their own security, their own future. People are becoming more self-sufficient and becoming more self-reliant, right? Like I'd use the term self-oriented. Beck sees women as the at the forefront of the individualized self. Beck sees women at the forefront of the individualized self. They are setting the pace for change. He argues that this is due to changes in women's family life, education, occupation, and the laws on gender equality. In this increasingly insecure, and individualized society, individuals must equip themselves for self-reliance and self-efficiency. Remember, remember, I had explained all of this a minute back. Education is seen as a vehicle. Education is seen as a mechanism. It's seen as a tool that could help you with becoming financially independent. Financial independence is seen as one of the main ways of doing this. And education is regarded as one of the main routes to well-paid jobs that can provide financial independence, right? I just read this out for you, but I'd explain this uh, earlier, okay? Now, taking this ahead, however, to continue this, right? One, we're talking about using education for financial independence. But do you think it is all about money? At times, it's not just because it's, at times, it's not... Uh, just because of money. Being educated would lead to you having a career for yourself. You having a career for yourself or you joining a profession means you holding an identity. It's so much more than just financial independence. You having an identity. You having an identity for the third time. You do not just work because you want to earn. You want to be recognized. You want to put in efforts. You want to have a career. You work for recognition, to self-recognition. You, as a female, if you're a female, you wouldn't just want to work because you want to earn. You might want to work because you want to be seen as an individual self. An individual, uh, you must, you, you, you're probably wanting to work because you want to be known as an accomplished person. It is not always about money. So according to Beck, again, when we speak about when we speak about when we speak about individualization, individualization has a lot to do with you having an identity for yourself as well. You being known for what you've accomplished, you being known for your profession, your career. Taking this ahead, however, education is not simply a means to financial security. Sociologists who picture a second modernity generally agree that there's an increasing emphasis on the construction of self and the creation of identity. Studies of girls in primary and secondary school illustrate this emphasis. And Francis and Skelton, the popular feminist again, according to Francis and Skelton, this is important, you, and this is important, and... Uh, yeah, this is important and you need to understand this. 
the majority of the majority appears to see that the chosen career as reflecting their identity choose a career that you would want to reflect uh, in your identity as a vehicle education should be used as a vehicle for future ful fulfillment education should be used as a vehicle for future fulfillment rather than as simply a stop gap between marriage this is very deep if you understand this if especially if you talk about the society that we're all a part of education by many or rather say a job job for uh, many is just a stop gap before marriage according to francis and skelton these feminists believe there are three things, right? This part that's highlighted over here in green, divide this into three parts and this would, this would help you understand it better. According to Francis and Skelton, the majority appear to see chosen career as reflecting their identity. So your career should ident help you with identification or your career, the career you choose is the career, should be the career that you want to identify yourself with, one. Number two, Use education as a vehicle for future fulfillment, right? Fulfillment doesn't necessarily have to be uh, with, uh, have to do with uh, financial independence or money. Number three, do not only use, uh, do not only work or get a job because you want a stop gap before you get married. Now, Taking, I hope you've all understood this and understood this well. This is Beck, the German sociologist, just in case if you're interested. Taking this ahead. Now, we spoke about, let me, let me take you back so that this would help you connect and realize where we are. So this is the topic that we're doing today. The topic was, the topic is rather, social changes and gendered achievement, social changes and gendered achievement. What I'd said was, while covering this topic, I'd like to cover this under the heading of six, six subheadings, changing expectations and attitudes, done. The women's movement and feminism, done. Changes in labor market, done. The fourth one is individualization and risk society, done. Now this part, the latter two, they have to do with the underachievement of uh, arguably the underachievement of boys. This is where we take a start from now. Now, the educational achievement of boys, the educational achievement of boys. In the 1970s and 1980s, like we discussed some half an hour back, a major concern was that girls are underachieving. However, by the 1990s, this concern had reversed. Now the concern was that boys were underachieving. However, there are many sociologists, many feminist sociologists typically, who question this concern. According to them, is it even the case? Is it even true that girls are uh, overdoing? Or if is it even true that girls are overachieving and boys are underachieving? Now, to know this better, let's take this ahead. It is important to note that in general, the educational attainment of boys and young men has steadily improved over the past 50 years. So according to many feminists, it has been seen that boys have improved. It's, it's a steady improvement, right? If there's an improvement, then why is it that uh, why is it that the concern has reversed towards male underachievement? Question mark. According to uh, many sociologists, typically feminists, there are certain boys who are underachieving today. And those certain boys, when I use the words, uh, when we use the word certain over here, who are these certain boys? They're probably boys from the working class background. So according to this, if we say that boys are underachieving, it's not all boys that are underachieving it's certain boys it's some boys boys from the lower social uh, economic background who are underachieving right but in that case they also add up that in that case they're the, the working class or the working class or girls from the lower socio socioeconomic status even they're underachieving so 
In general, the educational attainment of boys and young men has stead steadily improved over the past 50 years. This does not indicate underachievement. However, certain boys are underachieving. A higher proportion of working class boys are doing badly compared with other social groups. But the same can be said for working class girls as well. In the UK, for example, white working class boys from low income families who receive free, full, uh, free school meals are the lowest performing groups in terms of ethnicity, class and gender. So if you say boys are underachieving, you're typically referring to working class boys one and if you say working class boys are underachieving so is the case with working class girls and if that's the case why is it that there's so much of so much of you and cry about boys underachievement that's probably because so what has changed is the overall rate of improvement for boys and girls it has been seen that girls in the last 30 years have started doing better at a faster rate than boys remember when we discussed this right at the beginning it's if you talk about young boys even today if you have a look at how if you try to make a comparison between how boys are doing today as compared to how they were doing 50 years back you would witness a steady improvement what is making uh what is what is what is what is uh uh, uh causing this uh what what is leading to many politicians or even for the matter of fact media worrying about boys underachievement is actually girls doing better at a faster rate as compared to the boys this applies to resulting in a significant widening of gender gap this applies and this is important it's pretty important that you understand this this applies to boys and girls from all social classes whether this should be seen as boys underachievement is a matter of opinion some commentators suggest that this concern has reached the level of a moral panic. What does the word moral panic mean? A moral panic is typically, uh, this term is typically uh, used in relation to media. The idea that you keep on talking about something so much, to you keep on discussing it so much to the extent that everyone starts believing it to be true and everyone starts worrying. So, we are talking about how the press, the media, the politicians, they keep on talking about male underachievement to the point that they have made a common man believe that males are actually underachieving today. So Francis and Skelton again, 2005. There have been many attempts to explain boys' failure. So if it is boys, if, if it is boys underachievement, let's have a look at the factors that have led to this, right? So there have been many attempts to explain boys' failure to keep pace with girls. They're based on assumptions that boys are underachieving and that something should be done to raise their educational attainment. Some of these factors would be number one. Let's talk about these factors that have arguably led to male underachievement. To begin with, let's blame masculinity over here, the construction of masculinity. Now, when we speak about this construction of masculinity here, it's pretty important that we understand that schools, educational institutions, they play a very important role in terms of constructing masculinity. Recent research argues that the form of masculinity constructed in the classrooms contributes to the underachievement of male students. So we blaming masculinity over here. We're talking about, we, we're typically referring to the hegemonic form of masculinity. And what we're talking about over here is that the behavior within classrooms eventually leads to the underachievement of male students. Now, when we're referring to this behavior, what sort of behavior are we uh, talking about? We're talking about laddish behavior, laddish behavior. If you uh, may recall the study that was conducted by Paul Willis in 1970s on a working class, on a school located in a working class area where uh, it was an ethnographic study where Paul Willis, in his book that he wrote in 1977, Learning to Labor, where he tries explaining lads, those 12 boys on whom his research focused, the lads. We're referring to these as laddish behavior. So the idea is that if girl, if boys are underachieving, it's probably because of the anti-school subculture that they've formed. It's probably because of the form of masculinity that they've adapted and that reflects within classroom. It is because of the laddish behavior. 
Now, when we talk about this laddish behavior, this laddish behavior can be seen amongst many working class boys as so many working class boys as uh, the study that was conducted by, let me write it down here, Paul Willis, 1977, right? But however, according to uh, Carolyn Jackson, according to Jackson in 2006, it's not this laddish behavior isn't just restricted to working class boys. Today, many middle class boys, or for the matter of fact, even some girls have started adapting to this laddish behavior. And instead of instead of relying on the idea that it is uh, boy and boys under achievement, let's focus on the behavior that is witnessed within classroom by many boys typically from the working class, but at some um, in some instances, middle class boys or even girls too. Now we are uh, we, we, we blaming this laddish behavior or rather say not we, Carolyn Jackson, here you are. So Jackson is blaming this underachievement. Bla uh, Jackson is holding this laddish behavior responsible for the underachievement of male pupils. Taking this ahead, Jackson in 2006 examined laddish behavior among 13 to 14 year old boys as well as girls. Her research was based on interviews with 203 students in eight schools and questionnaires data from 800 students in six schools. Now, that's quite a lot of data. Let's have a look at what she found out. What Jackson found out was that for many students, or if we talk about this laddish behavior, this laddish behavior meant that these kids they found it pretty uncool to work they found it pretty uh uncool to show interest in academics and for them appearing in at that age remember we talking about young kids over here and at that age appearing cool was pretty important right appearing cool was pretty important at that age so laddish behavior is based on the idea that it is uncool to work and that appearing cool is necessary to be popular if you want to be popular you better act cool and if you work that would be seen as being uncool now if you start believing that working or putting in effort or showing interest towards academic makes you uncool. That pretty much explains why you're not performing well. Boys' laddish behavior was constructed within a framework of hegemonic masculinity. Now, a few features of hegemonic masculinity that you have been taught earlier in AS as well. Hegemonic masculinity was based on heterosexuality, being tough, being competitive, acting hard. Disrupting lessons, having a laugh, being demanding, being assertive. Academic work was seen as effeminate or being feminine and uncool. Students are faced, according, according to uh, Jackson, students today are confused. They're actually facing a dilemma. Now, this is, again, another point that requires a lot of attention, and this makes a lot of sense, too. Let's connect dots. Let's go back and connect dots. If these young boys or if these young pupils if these young students believe that putting in efforts or showing interest towards education is being uncool that means they would not study at school at least right at, at least at school they wouldn't study however at the same time they would want to uh, do well academically too so look at the dilemma i mean the dilemma is you don't want to act nerd like a nerd you don't want to be known as a geek you don't want to be known as someone who takes a lot of interest in education however at the same time you want to do academically well as well this has resulted according to jackson this has resulted in some kids not showing a lot of interest at school but at the same time going back home and secretly studying right going back home and studying secretly however it should also be noted that not all students would have the resources to do so. Not all students, not all pupils would have enough of personal space at home, the resources. Not all students would be able to 
afford a private tutor, which again consequently leads to middle class pupils being advantaged here. They have enough of resources to act cool at school by not studying, going back home and secretly studying. However, when we speak about individuals, if you speak about pupils, if you speak about students from the working class origin, they do not have enough of resources. Because they do not have enough of resources, this consequently leads to them not doing well. So let me give this a read. The solution is to appear to reject schoolwork, do not do the requisite amount of messing around, but work secretly, usually at home. This favors middle class boys who have home-based resources to do their homework quickly and efficiently. They have the space, privacy, desk, and a computer. They're better able to balance being popular and academically successful. But remember when I said this probably might work for middle-class pupils, but it would not work for working-class pupils because they do not have those resources. Now, if you've understood it so far, yeah, I know this particular topic takes uh, longer than others. But nonetheless, I'd like to do this in one go. So another 10, 15 minutes and then we'd be through. So if we talk about the explanations behind the development of laddish behavior, why is it? Why is it that young kids appear to be behaving like this? Why is it that they want to? Why is it that they feel like showing interest towards academics is being uncool? One of the possible reasons could be because of the pressure to succeed, because of the pressure to succeed, right? On one end, these young kids, they are being, they know that there's a lot of competitiveness, right? We're referring to this as competitive individualism. Let me repeat, we're talking about the explanations for the development of laddish behavior. If boys or if these young pupils, they're behaving in this manner, why is it that they're behaving in this particular manner? They point to the changes in the wider society which have occurred at the same time as the widening gender gap in educational attainment. So number one, the first factor, pressure to succeed and fear of failure. A number of sociologists have seen competitive individualism, competitive individualism and individual responsibility. At one end, you know that there's a lot of competition. On the other end, you know that you are, I mean, if you talk about a typical uh, young boy being raised under uh, hegemonic masculinity, he would be, he would have a lot of pressure. Uh, he would have been told time and again since a very young age that tomorrow he has to be the whole soul bread, breadwinner. So on one end, there's individual competitiveness. On the other end, there's a lot of individual responsibility on them, right? So this promotes the fear of academic failure, right? Which deep down inside is making you scared. You want to do well. You don't want to look uncool. But at the same time, you're fearing academic failure too. You're fearing academic failure because there's a lot of pressure on you of having so many responsibilities because there's a lot of pressure on you because of individual competitiveness. This promotes fears of academic failure and directs responsibility for failure to the individual. Laddish behavior can be seen as a response to this. So are we talking about a coping mechanism? Is this a coping mechanism? Question mark. The argument that it is uncool to work can be used as an excuse for poor academic performance. There you go. You could use it as an excuse because, see, uh, eventually you're not doing well in academics. An excuse that you could use over here is that you did not put in effort because, because it was being uncool and you did not want to be uh, uncool or not popular at school. The marketization of school has placed further pressure on students. Schools compete in the educational market. We've known, we know all of this. We've studied all of this earlier. Schools compete in the educational market, striving to raise standards and climb league table. table. The importance of examination success is increasingly emphasized and students are undergoing pressure, undergoing pressure to achieve high grades. Laddish behavior can be seen as a defense strategy, like I was saying, a coping mechanism to reduce the fear of poor academics performance or to excuse the reality of 
failure because deep down inside these young boys fear failure they use this as an excuse to this uh, to this failure according to jackson caroline jackson in the year 2006 now my dear we discussed all of this under the heading of the explanations for the development of laddish behavior explanation for the development of laddish behavior one explanation the first explanation that we discussed was pressure to succeed and fear of failure pressure to succeed and fear of failure the second explanation that we bring in under a discussion over here is the crisis of masculinity the crisis of masculinity now this crisis of masculinity if you may recall you were taught this back in the as while discussing gender identities the crisis of masculinity remember over the last 25 to 30 35 40 years there's been a steep decline in manual jobs which we as we discussed earlier, is because of uh, uh, advancements in the industrial sector. If there aren't jobs that you could have gotten, like if you compare this with the 1977 study by Paul Willis, remember those boys, those 12 lads, they were not studying because they knew for a fact that even if they did not study, they would end up getting manual jobs. But guess what? That was 1977. Today, it's been what, uh, 87, 97, 2007, 2007, 87, 97, 2007, 2017, almost. So yeah, so some 45 years back, things were different 45 years back. There wasn't, uh, the, 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 the 45 years back, Working class individuals knew for a fact that even if they did not do well academically, they would get jobs in the, uh, in the they would get manual jobs. However, today things have changed. Some sociologists argue that boys and men are experiencing a uh, crisis of masculinity in contemporary society. This has been linked in part to changes in the labor market and the rapid decline in unskilled and semi-skilled jobs over the last twenty five years. Like I explained, the macho manual jobs reflected traditional male working identities their disappearance has left these identities uncertain and under threat the new jobs in the service sector required were what were what were traditionally seen as feminine jobs and sensitiveness sensitivities now again if you remember if you remember lads you'd be remembering year roles too remember 1977 paul willis learning to labor on one extreme, we had Paul Willis had mentioned lads and on the other extreme, year olds. These year olds, they were seen to be pretty feminine because remember, they were, they were, they were, they were, uh, or for these lads, uh, studying had to do with getting clerical jobs, which they found pretty feminine. Working class boys may have responded to these threats to their traditional identities by turning to laddish behavior in school now, why is it that they're doing this? They're doing this probably to restore this sense of masculinity, the sense of masculinity that they, uh, or the identity, the masculine identity, the hegemonic masculinity, the hegemonic masculine identity that they were uh, wanting or that they were looking forward towards. Today, they do not have enough of opportunities to live them, to experience them because those manual jobs that they considered the macho jobs, that they considered the very manly jobs, the jo those jobs have disappeared. If those jobs have disappeared, where do you think they'd be uh, showing this masculinity, this hegemonic masculinity? They're probably doing this. Working class boys may have responded to these threats to their traditional identities by turning to laddish behavior at school, right? So if anything, they wanted to restore that sort of masculinity at school that sense of masculinity that was experiencing threat if working class boys believe that males no longer have a clear-cut role in society this could impact on their self-esteem and motivation at school so the second factor the third factor real quick uh, real quick we discuss educational aspirations and attitudes educational aspirations Girls today have more of educational aspirations. They have more of career aspirations. They have more of role models, like I explained earlier, as compared to boys. So the more 
career aspirations you have, the more educational aspirations you have, the more motivated you feel. The more motivated you feel, the more likely it is that you would want to put in efforts in at school. So research by Rampino and Taylor in 2013 and 2015 based on a self-completion questionnaire given to 13 to 15 year old boys in uh, 14, 13 to 15 year old kids in Britain. They produced the following findings. One, girls were more likely than boys to see education in a positive light, to want to continue in school after age 16 and go on to university. Now look at the difference in terms of the attitude that you're carrying, right? Now, according to the study by Rampino and Taylor, girls were more likely than boys they were more likely than boys to see education in a positive light they were more likely to continue being at school at the age of after the age of 16 and to go on to university this is this reflects a change in the attitude the change in the expectation the change in the goals you've set for yourself these gender differences remained whatever their parents income and education one let me just write one here so that you could number two Boys, on the other, other hand, boys' educational aspirations and attitudes tended to become less positive from the age of 12 and 13. As they grow older, their educational aspirations and their attitudes, they started becoming less positive. Whereas those of girls stayed the same, or in some cases, they even grew as they grew older, right? Number three. Unlike boys, girls were more aware of economic downturns when it was harder to get a job. They were more likely to see education as important for employment as compared to the boys. So the more economic, the, 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 the more uh, they felt that there'd be an economic downturn instead of uh, losing hope, these young girls as compared to boys, they wanted to put in more of efforts. They uh, had more of educational aspiration or their attitude towards education had started getting more serious so that they could do well in education and get a job ahead, which was not seen to be true for boys. Now, if we sum this entire thing up and conclude this, conclusion of what? Conclusion of the topic, social changes and education and differences in terms of uh, uh, education attainment on the basis of gender. Boys' underachievement has become a major concern. Large amounts of time and money were spent on a range of government initiatives aimed to at raising boys' educational attainment. This, again, you see it's coming from Francis and Skelton. However, this has been criticized by Francis and Skelton. Like I said, over the last few decades, a lot of concern has been shown towards boys' underachievement. According to Francis and Skelton, the extent to which boys under achievement is seen to be a concern has gotten to the point that educational inequality in terms of social class educational inequality in terms of ethnicity or educational inequality experienced by females or girls is being compromised today because according to francis and skelton again 2005 popular feminists According to them, today, the major concern everyone has is that boys are underachieving. Little do they think about girls' underachievement. Little do they think about differences in terms of achievement on the basis of social class or, for the matter of fact, even ethnicity. So some critiques, however, argue that the whole question of equality of education opportunity has been reduced to gender gender and focused on boys this has diverted attention from class ethnicity and girls according to stephen ball in 2013 to a great extent the problem of boys and achievement is a working class one so according to stephen ball when we talk about boys and achievement it's typically working class boys like we had studied earlier in that case working class girls also underachieve and one for those from some ethnic minority groups but this is often lost sight of in both the media and policy initiatives. So both Stephen, Paul, and Francis and Skelton, they agree to the point that there's uh, a lot of emphasis being laid on male underachievement, which is not even the case. To the point that today, a lot is being compromised, including differences in terms of social class, differences in terms of ethnicity, and the underachievement of females. Now, I hope uh, this lesson helped. 
it took longer than usual, but I hope it was worth it. I hope you all took uh, notes. If you did not, you always have an option of uh, replaying this video and rewatching it and uh, making notes. Uh, so yeah, it is uh, pretty much it for the day. Take good care of yourselves. Stay happy, healthy, safe, and protected. Stay humble, spread positivity, spread smiles, and Allah Hafiz.